let's look at question number nine. Now, which of the following would be true if the blood lacked RBCs and just had plasma and the lungs were functioning normally? Now, this is basically to uh, assess your understanding of what is oxygen content, what is PO2, what is SpO2, right? Uh, the, uh, now, when I look at the oxygen content of the blood, when I see oxygen content of the blood, this is the oxygen in combination with hemoglobin oxygen in combination with hemoglobin plus the dissolved oxygen. Oxygen is transported in two ways, in combination with hemoglobin and this, and this dissolved oxygen. Now, how do I calculate the oxygen in combination with hemoglobin? This is hemoglobin in grams per deciliter into 1.34 into 1.34 into the saturation, which is sometimes also called the SpO2, right? Saturation. The dissolved oxygen, on the other hand, refers this can be measured in terms of PO2, PO2 in millimeters of mercury. And if I want to convert the PO2 in millimeters of mercury into ml per deciliter, I multiply it by a uh, the solubility of oxygen, which is 0 0.003 ml per 100 ml per millimeter of mercury. If I solve this equation, I get the total oxygen content of the blood in ml per deciliter. Now, uh, with this background, if I tackle this question, now it says the blood lacked RBCs. Yes, so obviously this part of oxygen transport does not happen in this case. But what is going to be normal here is going to be the dissolved oxygen. And dissolved oxygen is measured in terms of PO2 in millimeters of mercury. So arterial PO2 would be normal, but the oxygen content of the blood will obviously be reduced. Let's see question number 10. In a high potassium, in a person on a high potassium diet, which part of the nephron would be ex expected to secrete? Secrete. Potassium is the only ion which is both reabsorbed and secreted, but the secretion of potassium occurs in the late DCT and the collecting duct under the influence of aldosterone. Question number 11. Which of the following are best suited to measure the interstitial fluid volume? Now, interstitial fluid volume is an indirect measurement. It is to be, me it cannot be measured directly. It is an indirect measurement. And when I say indirect measurement, this is basically the, how do I do this? This is total body water minus the ECF. This is interstitial. Let's have a look at question number 11. Now question number 11 says, which of the following are best suited to measure the intracellular fluid volume? Now the measurement of intracellular fluid volume, now this is an indirect measurement. And when I say indirect measurement, this is basically total body water. This is going to be indirect measurement. This is basically total body water minus the ECF. And to measure the total body water, this is ICF. ICF is total body water minus the ECF. And to measure the total body water, heavy water, that is D2O, is most commonly used. And for the measurement of ECF, uh, there are substances like inulin, sucrose, mannitol, radioactive sodium, which are going to be used, but uh, the, the most accurate being inulin. So the best combination here becomes heavy water and inulin, heavy water and inulin. Inulin and radioactive sodium are meant for ECF. These are both meant for ECF. Heavy water is meant for uh, total body water total body water. Radioactive albumin is meant for plasma measurement, right? Uh, so the best answer here is of course the uh, is A. Let's have a look at question number 12. Which nephron segment is the primary site of magnesium reabsorption in normal conditions? Now majority of the magnesium is going to be reabsorbed not in the PCT but in the thick ascending loop, limb of loop of Henle. 65% of the filtered magnesium will be reabsorbed in the thick ascending limb and only 25% is reabsorbed in the PCT. Unlike, let's say, another divalent ion, which is calcium. Majority of the calcium is reabsorbed in the PCT, uh, whereas in the case of magnesium, like I said, this is going to be the thick ascending limb and less than 5% of magnesium is reabsorbed in the DCT and the collecting ducts. <clears throat> 
Let's have a look at question number 13. Which of the following conditions is associated with increased mean systemic filling pressure? Now, please understand what is going to be the, uh, what is mean systemic filling pressure? Mean systemic filling pressure is the pressure uh, recorded from or measured, recorded from all vessels, both arteries and veins, when the heart stops beating or the circulation is at a standstill. Yes, when the circulation is, is stops or the heart stops beating, circulation is at a standstill. Pressure in all vessels, whether it's arteries and veins, will equilibrate, and that is known as a mean systemic filling pressure. Now, there are two determinants of the mean systemic filling pressure, and number one is blood volume, and number two is the vascular tone. Vascular tone. Uh, a slightly better than vascular tone would be probably the venous tone. Because remember, most of the blood volume is present. Two-thirds of the blood volume is present on the venous side of the circulation. So venous tone becomes important. Right? So whenever there is an increase in blood volume, there will be increase in the mean systemic filling pressure. Now, uh, A decreased blood volume will decrease the mean systemic filling pressure. Yes. What, what will happen to the blood volume in congestive cardiac failure? Now, in congestive cardiac failure, there is sodium and water retention. Yes. There is a secondary hyperaldosteronism, which causes this sodium and water retention, and that turn increases the blood volume. So, uh, there we do expect the mean systemic filling pressure to increase in uh, congestive cardiac failure. Let's see what will happen in sympathetic inhibition and venous dilation. Now, these are two conditions which are associated with a decrease in vascular tone. So, what is going to happen here is a uh, decrease in the mean systemic filling pressure. So, my best answer here becomes congestive cardiac failure. Question number 14. Which part of the circulation has the highest compliance? Which is the most compliant vessel? Which is the most distensible vessel out of these? Iota and the large arteries have a, a large content of elastic tissue. Yes, they are distensible, but the most distensible vessels are going to be the veins. Veins are thin walled and have the maximum distensibility. Question number 15. In resting adult, what is the normal ventricular ejection fraction? Normal ventricular ejection fraction is approximately 55 to 65%. So my best answer, 60%. What is ejection fraction? Ejection fraction is going to be the stroke volume divided by the end diastolic volume. Normally, normal this is 55 to 65%. Which of the following would be the most important in contributing to satiety after a large meal rich in fats? Now, a large meal rich in fats, now this will cause release of CCK by the duodenum. CCK is an agent which acts centrally to produce satiety. Ghrelin is orexigenic. It increases the appetite. Leptin produces satiety, so decreased leptin secretion will produce, uh, will not contribute to satiety. Peptide YY also contributes to, sati to satiety, so these will not be able to contribute to, to satiety. Therefore, your answer here is A, release of CCK by the duodenum. Question number 17. Calcium is responsible for the upstroke of the action potential. Which of the following? In the cardiac muscle, the upstroke is by sodium. Skeletal muscle, sodium influx is responsible for the upstroke of the action potential. Extraocular muscles, sodium influx. It is only the cardiac pacemaker cells and the smooth muscles of uh, smooth muscles where the upstroke is due to a calcium influx.